Hey guys, welcome in another episode, a little bit of life podcast right here with your host, Little. I am so excited to have on our host today. I She is amazing. You have seen her everywhere on documentaries. You've seen her on Netflix, The Bad Surgeon. She doesn't need an introduction. Benita, welcome on. How are you today? No, I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. That's very sweet. You are such a strong woman for everything that you've gone through, for everything that you've endured. I don't think the documentaries out there have really done you complete justice because when we think of a powerhouse and an empowering female, you're it. You're a journalist and you fell in love with someone that you least expected. So bring us back to that day. I, at the time when I met Dr. Paola Meccherini, I was kind of at the height of my career. I had a job that I loved at NBC. I was a very successful producer. Um, I had been there for 17 years or 16 years, I guess, at that point when I met him. I loved my job. I was living in New York, you know, had a daughter, loved my life. And he, we were doing a story about regenerative medicine, which is this very promising field in medicine where they basically are trying to create new body parts in the lab. And he was at the forefront of this field and was considered the pioneer in this field and was, his nickname was a super surgeon. And so we decided to focus a story around his work and his next surgery, which was going to be done in the U.S. And that's how I first met him. And a lot of people that watch the documentary series, it was not love at first sight. You were still professional. You felt this feeling and you pushed it aside. You continued on, especially since you were covering the story. Yeah, it was very hard. And it's something that I talk about a lot. I ended up crossing a, a sort of an a no-no in journalism, which is uh, there's an ethical line, a j sort of an unwritten, invisible journalistic line that you don't get involved with the subject of a story. And there's a very good reason for that, right? Because as journalists, we need to be objective. And if you get involved with somebody that you're doing a story about, your ob objectivity could obviously go flying out the window. When I met him, I was at a very vulnerable stage in my life. My ex-husband, who I'd been divorced from for a couple of years at that point, was dying of brain cancer. We had a be then be nine-year-old beautiful daughter who was daddy's little girl. And I knew she was gonna be absolutely devastated by this. And I was struggling with how to tell her, what to tell her, what's this gonna mean for her life, you know, for our life. Uh, I was also simultaneously dealing with my own health scare. And so I don't think I realized how vulnerable I was, but that's when he kind of, you know, we became friends first, you know, and he seemed initially to be a very good listener and just so caring, you know, and so humble and kind and so interested in this little girl that he'd never met. And that's how I kind of fell for him. You know, it was over the course of months of I was sort of pouring my heart out to him and then, you know, he kept trying to initiate something and I kept pushing back saying, I can't get involved with you. You know, I'm doing a story about you. But at some point, it just became impossible to resist. I mean, he was just this incredible man or seemed to be, you know, he turns out to be exactly the opposite of what I thought he was. But at the time, and I talk about this a lot, when you're vulnerable, you know, you just want love. You want somebody to put their arms around you and tell you that everything's going to be okay. And he was that guy for me. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the Netflix series, you're very open and honest about what you were going through and actions and his words matched. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was like romance on steroids. I, he, we were together almost two years. You know, this was not some fly by night, quick romance. And he, I've never experienced anything like it in my life. It, he was so romantic. I mean, everywhere we went were these, he loved to surprise me, these huge elaborate surprises. So every time he flew me all over the world, you know, every hotel room, there'd be rose petals on the floor, or huge bouquets of flowers, the most expensive bottles of champagne. I mean, on and on and on to the point that every time we traveled, people in the hotel would be, you know, pulling me aside, like, does he have a brother? Who is this guy? You know? Um, and when I came home from trips, all my friends were hanging on the edge of their seat, you know, living the fairy tale with me. Like, what did he do? What did he do now? You know? And they all said the same thing. They all said that we had renewed their faith in love, you know, and that I was living this kind of magical 
fairy tale. And I was at the beginning, I was blissfully happy. You know, I felt like I was floating on clouds. It started as a beautiful love story. Mm. And it did not end that way at all. It sure didn't. <laughs> mm. And we've talked about it before. He, his actions and his words matched, especially not just with you, but with your daughter as well. He embraced your daughter, yeah. took your daughter everywhere and really involved her in your love story, which is really important as a mom. You know, look, she was nine years old. She had just lost her dad to brain cancer, which was awful. And nobody could step into her dad's shoes. And I knew nobody ever would, but he seemed at the time like a good so-called replacement. You know, he was incredibly kind and giving and caring, not just with me, but with my daughter and with my friends and family. And he seemed very invested in her life. And, you know, I remember thinking if I could still talk to my ex-husband, you know, John, that he would probably approve of this guy, you know, and some of the guys I had dated after a divorce, I don't think he did approve of, <laughs> but I thought this one he would. He seemed, you know, he was this worldly, intelligent man who was doing this groundbreaking surgery, was rumored to be in contention for a Nobel Prize, and, you know, people adored him. And, um, and more than that, though, he just seemed so devoted to helping people who had no other hope and so caring and so humble, you know, and that was very admirable. You know, he was, he was very intriguing, but also very admirable. You know, I had a lot of respect for him, you know, and somebody that was willing to take risks that nobody else would take. And he certainly seemed to be the kind of person that I would want in my life and that, yeah, that I would want in my daughter's life. Mm -hmm. I think everybody would. I mean, he came with the most exceptional resume. He yeah. was this incredible surgeon. And, you know, as you said in the Netflix document, he looked like George Clooney. Yeah. Great looking, <laughs> sweet, you know, casual. But for a man that listens, that's like unheard of these days, especially when you need someone there at that time. Yeah. I mean, he... At the time, I mean, I was pouring my heart out to him about all this stuff, and he was giving me really good advice. I mean, very thoughtful, considerate, kind, sage advice about, you know, before her dad died, what to tell her, how to tell her, what to expect afterwards. And because he's a surgeon who obviously had dealt with people at death's door, he he was telling me things that nobody else could tell me, you know, and... I was soaking it up, you know, I needed that. And he seemed to be just so vested in me and my daughter. In in hindsight, I now know that that's something that con artists do. They draw information out of you. You know, they're gathering basically ammunition to use against you. You know, they don't tell you a lot about themselves, but they gather all this information about you and anybody would fall for it because you think, wow, this person's so caring and considerate and such a good listener and he cares so much. That's not really what's going on, but that's certainly what it seems like. He proposed fairly quickly, which is another thing that I now talk about um, in hindsight that these people tend to move way too quickly. You know, um, the normal trajectory of, trajectory of love is, you know, it takes time. It takes time to get to know somebody. It takes time to fall in love, even though there's that high at the beginning of any relationship. Um, but he, we, I guess it had been about six months, you know, we, we were dating and he proposed at Christmas, but it was a very beautiful, simple proposal. I mean, and that was the beauty of it. He was always doing these over the top, elaborate, crazy surprises, you know, and spending tons of money and the proposal was just at home at Christmas. It was just me and my daughter and Paolo. And it was, I was totally floored. I did not have any idea that this was coming. And he just handed me a little box that I thought was a gift. And I opened it and this ring was in there. And it was sweet because he never actually said that day, will you marry me? And my daughter gave him a very hard time afterwards. You know, she said, you're, you're supposed to get down, you're supposed to get down on one knee, you're supposed to do this. So he ended up proposing again a couple of different times after that. Um, at the time, it was more a promise of marriage because at the beginning, he told me 
I knew from the very beginning that he was separated. He had a wife in Italy that he'd been separated from for many years. They lived separate lives, and that was well established. He lived in Barcelona. She lived in Italy. And he claimed he had never gotten divorced because they're Catholic, and it's Italy, and it's complicated. And But now he said now that he'd met me, he wanted to finally get divorced. So when he proposed, he was supposedly going through his divorce. So we... It was more of a promise of marriage, and then about six months later, he told me the divorce went through, and he proposed again. The level of lies is oh, it's unbelievable. Insane. It's insane. Mm. Yeah. And watching, you know, all of the documentaries, and there's a show that I'll put in the bio as well description that you've created. A lot of people are asking, like, how did you not know? How did you yeah. not see red flags? Especially because you're a journalist. And this is so upsetting to me because, like we've said, the actions and the words matched. Like, all of the other stuff later hadn't come out yet. All of the, you sure. know, the whistleblowers and medical stuff like that. You had no idea. So bring us to when you found kind of all that out and became that journalist versus just the partner. And to answer the first part quickly, I think it's very easy in hindsight, right? You know, once now you have all the information, it's very easy to go back and like, well, how didn't you know? How didn't you know? But I also think it's very important because there is a form of gaslighting that goes on with these con artists and it's extreme cunning manipulation. And so when you're in the thick of it, you know, you don't realize what's happening. You know, it's very subtle. You know, it's just a very slow, meticulous weaving of this web of lies. And they're very good at making you feel like something's wrong with you. So if you question them, you know, you tell me something and I ask you, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, and ask questions, they're so good at shooting you down. You know, rapid fire. I would never lie to you. Why would I lie to you? And the evidence and bam, bam, bam. And so convincing that you start questioning yourself. You know, I call it the fog. You start thinking, okay, okay, you know, maybe it's me. And so when you're in the thick of it, it's very hard to sort of see what's actually really happening because they're so convincing and they're criminals. Um, so I think towards the end, we were together for almost two years. We were supposed to get married in July of 2015. Towards the end of our relationship, as the wedding was approaching, there were a lot of little things that were starting to bother me. And <clears throat> one of the biggest was he had flown me all over the world, literally everywhere, beautiful trips. We had never been to Barcelona, where he lived, and where we were supposed to be moving after the wedding. He let me quit my job. I pulled my daughter out of her very difficult to get into school in New York, and we were planning to ride off into the sunset with him in Barcelona, but we hadn't been to his house. And I kept saying, who marries a man without seeing the house, you know, where they're going to move? Every single time we had a trip, it got canceled at the last minute because he had a quote-unquote emergency surgery. This happened probably three or four times, but now I had had it, you know. I was already, I'm like this, I, I'm not marrying you without seeing the place where I'm going to live. I'm not marrying you without showing my daughter. So that was really bothering me. And then there were little things about the wedding that weren't making sense now. He had told me he wanted to surprise me with everything for the wedding, which fit with our whole relationship because he had surprised me throughout our whole relationship. Very romantic. And everybody thought it was so romantic. Oh, you know, he's planning the wedding. He's surprising you with everything. But as we're getting closer, we had hundreds of guests coming from all over the world. And they're asking me questions. You know, he's claimed he rented out this castle for everybody to stay in. Okay, they're asking me the name of the castle. He won't give me the name of the castle. How are we getting from the airport to the castle? He won't answer any questions. So I think all these little red flags were sort of bubbling underneath. Unfortunately, there's a reason they have that saying that love is blind. It is a little bit blind. And I've almost two years in after I, so much is at stake now, I've given up everything. I think at that point, there was a part of me that didn't want to believe that anything was wrong. And also it wasn't blatant, it wasn't overt, right? There was nothing that I could actually point my finger at yet and go, okay, you're lying. But then eight weeks before the wedding, um, I found out that details about the wedding were not true. And somehow, I think in that moment, just because of all these little red flags, I just knew, you know, it's, it's like lightning hits you, you know, and I thought, wow, this man's lying to me about everything. And 
I would come to find out that he was. I mean, I would hire a private investigator, do my own investigating, and I mean, he was literally, literally lying about everything. I, I, absolutely everything. For a lot of your relationship, you did long distance. How was his consistency of keeping in contact with you? I mean, even with Barcelona, did you see like parts of the house or anything like that? He was in touch constantly, all day long, every day. Um, he was in New York a lot, at least once a month, usually twice. We traveled a lot and we would take long trips, you know, 10 days a week. We talked all day long, every day. He texted constantly, you know, and um, always in the morning, always at night. He sent me videos, lots of videos from the house in Barcelona, you know, inside the house, showing me the house, sitting out on the front of the house. What I would later realize, of course, is that he very rarely said my name in these videos. So now I think he was taping these videos and just hitting send to all these different women. But <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. Um, yeah. Mm. And he That's sent awesome. tons of videos, all these loving, he was just, he was, it was romance on steroids. He was so over the top, you know, all these gushing, I love you messages. I mean, he, he literally bombarded me with love. He made you feel completely wrapped in love. And I did feel wrapped in love. You know, I believed him. The consistency of the con man, they literally make sure to keep up their narrative as they go. Right. And he took it to such extreme lengths. I mean, he flew me and my daughter to Italy to meet his mother. You know, we sat in his mother's kitchen. She made us a homemade meal. She pulled out photo albums from when he was a kid. His sister's daughter was supposed to be one of our flower girls. I talked to his sister on the phone. I mean, I don't really know anyone in the in that circumstance that would be suspicious why would I be suspicious I mean who he wasn't just telling me things he was showing me he was doing it you know so mm -hmm. it, it was it was nuts so you hire a private investigator and you become an investigator mm -hmm. yourself and you fly over to see for yourself with some of your girlfriends take us to that day what happened you know, when I first found out he was lying to me, I decided to kind of play a game with him. I decided I'm not going to tell him that I'm onto him yet. And the reason I did that was because I knew, given what I talked to you bef about before, about this fog, that if I confronted him, he would try to deny everything. So I wanted indisputable, you know, just solid evidence before I confronted him. And so I called off the wedding. I told him he was having some problems at work at the time. And I called off the wedding and said that, look, you're too stressed. It's just not a good time. And then I hired a private investigator and I started doing my own investigating. And it took, it took no time at all to figure out that everything about the wedding was a lie. He created, he created this whole twisted, sick fantasy wedding that was just ne never going to happen. None of the places were booked. None of it was true. None of the celebrity guests he said he, invi he had invited, he didn't even know them, you know. It was all this sick, twisted fantasy in his head. He wasn't even divorced. He told me that he had gotten divorced. He never legally got divorced. He never could have legally married me in the first place. But sort of the last piece of the puzzle for me was Barcelona, right? You know, there had to be a very good reason that he hadn't taken me to Barcelona. So I wanted to go and see for myself. And... I went with a couple of girlfriends and the wedding got canceled so close to the actual date that a lot of people still went to Italy. And I asked a couple of my closest friends to come with me. And we went to the house in Barcelona. Funny story about that, not funny, but when I was planning the trip, he had given me an address to the house in Barcelona so people could send wedding gifts. It was a bogus address. <laughs> So I, you know, oh, wow. yeah, so I figured out the right address and I didn't know what I was going to find there. I b bought this hideous blonde wig to take with me because I didn't know if I was going to need a disguise. And part of that was just trying to have some fun with this whole upside down mess. And so we went to the house in Barcelona and I stayed in the car wearing this blonde wig and my girlfriends went to the door. He had told me that he was in Russia you know, we had, we were still communicating at that point. He had no idea that I was in Europe. So the first thing, of course, I see him come down the steps. He's not in Russia and I'm recording in the car and you see it in bad surgeon. I'm just screaming and swearing and crying. And, but
But the killer was about, you know, two minutes into him talking to my friends. Um, I hear these little kids and I see another woman. And even from where I am, I know what his wife, the Italian wife looks like. It's not her. This is a much younger woman. And I can hear the kids calling him dad. So in this house in Barcelona, where at that point, this was six days after the wedding, I was supposed to be living already. He was hiding another family. So the entire time, our whole two year relationship, he had been balancing. At that time, I knew about three families. He had never divorced a wife in Italy. Then he had me and my daughter in New York and in Barcelona, he had this other family that he was hiding. So that for me was the final straw. Um, even though in the scheme of things, I don't even know if that's the worst thing that he did, you know, since he made up an entire fake fantasy wedding, but that's when I just fell apart and lost it. And that's what you see in, in Bad Surgeon. Your reaction is guttural. It is something that women that have been in a similar position of be, becoming that investigator and finding answers. Yeah you're crushed, you are destroyed, and you can hear it in yeah. that moment. It's heart-wrenching. It's actually hard for me to listen to still. Um, I still sometimes get emotional when I listen to it. Um, I was recording myself, and then as my friends came back to the car, they actually forgot. They had their phones recording because they had had them in their pocket recording when they went to the door. And I, I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm crying from somewhere deep within me you know it's like a, a deep guttural visceral wail it's not even a cry and it was just everything I had been investigating him for two months at that point and I don't think I had really dealt with the heartbreak and the devastation of realizing that basically I was in love with somebody that didn't exist right that I I the man that I thought I was spending the rest of my life with was an enigma he didn't exist and then on top of that this fact that he's hiding another family the whole time and the level of the lies and the absurdity of the lies, you know, creating this entire fake fantasy wedding and allowing me to give up everything, like letting it go that far, letting me quit my job, letting me pull my daughter out of her school, lying to my daughter who had just lost her dad. You know, he sat in front of her in our kitchen talking to her about the school he had enrolled her in in Barcelona and the life that she was going to live in Barcelona. And just thinking about how the hell do you do that? How do you sit in front of a little girl who just lost her dad and tell her just, you know, flat out disgusting lies and letting all my friends and family buy plane tickets and book hotels and, you know, spend all this money on this wedding that you know is never going to happen. I mean, it's, it's just, depraved it's sickening it's beyond it's still beyond comprehension to me like how do you how do you lie like that and live with yourself you know i can't imagine as a parent having to have that conversation then with your daughter because she grew close to him as well yeah you know it's interesting towards the end they had started to grow apart a little bit and i think it's because when he first came into our lives. She was very vulnerable too. You know, she had just lost her dad. As the relationship went on, she's very smart. And he, I think he realized he couldn't manipulate her as much. And so he kind of lost interest in her. And that was one of the things that we were arguing about. I kept trying to get him to come to therapy with us and he wouldn't go. And I think she was starting to, she didn't know what it was, but she was starting to clue in that something wasn't right. Um, and in a way that made it easier, I think, for her to, to, to get over it. But it's, I don't know, it's so traumatizing. And still to this day, all these years later, I'm finding out things that he did that I didn't know about and that he was sort of trying to pit us against each other. It's so twisted. And I, to this day, that's the thing I remain the, the most angry about, the, the fact that he could do that to a child and the fact that he he just played with both of us and you know i'm lucky and i'm lucky that we're still very close and we have a very close relationship but he could have completely destroyed that i mean he, he didn't care mm -hmm. and we have you on as well because the wedding and the romance and the love story that's not where it ends he no. was manipulating the medical community which 
when you think about that is massive of what he's done. Yeah. And that's the most frightening part. I mean, when I found out that he was lying to me about everything, I think I went through what most women go through when you're conned to this extent or to any extent like this by somebody. It's so embarrassing. It's humiliating. I mean, on top of the, the, utter heartbreak and devastation is this shame and guilt and embarrassment. Like, how did I fall for this? How could I be so stupid? How did I let this happen? I know I'm smart. You know, why didn't I see the red flags? And so you, you really beat yourself up and the inclination is to want to shrink away and hide, you know, and I wanted to, I kind of wanted to crawl under the bed and never come out. Um, but on that flight home from Barcelona, after finding the family in the house, I had almost a terrifying epiphany. I thought, oh my God, you know, if he's lying to me like this and telling these just absurd, insane lies that know no end, you know, there's no limit to his lies. <clears throat> there is no way <clears throat> he's not lying in the medical and professional arena as well. And <clears throat> that was terrifying. And I had no direct evidence of that, but I thought, Oh my God, you know, he's, his nickname was a super surgeon. You know, he worked at the place that awards the Nobel Prize in medicine. People thought this man walked on water. He was doing this groundbreaking revolutionary surgery, these transplants that nobody else in the world was doing. And I thought people are in danger. He has people's lives in his hands. And that's why I decided to go public. I thought I felt an urgency actually I, uh, to go public. I thought at the time I might be the only person that had the information and the means, you know, to expose him and put it out there that he's not who he says he is. And that's why I decided it doesn't matter how embarrassed I am. I, I need to tell my story because people need to know that Dr. Paolo Meccherini is not who you think he is. What an amazing strength that you have, because like you said, when you feel that you've been manipulated and you feel that you've kind of been in this situation where I should have known better, I should have seen this, you're embarrassed, like you said, but then to put it out for the media, for everybody, I mean, it is the world that is watching and talking about your story. You're going to have so many people that agree, that disagree, the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. So I can't even begin to imagine the strength of going from, yes, I'm ready to get this out there to everybody in the world knows my business now. It's not easy. I'll tell you that. It's still not easy. Um, I think in some ways I was wholly unprepared for what came with that. You know, I, I was determined just to expose him and put it out there. And it wasn't about revenge, you know, at all. It wasn't about spite. It wasn't even about telling my story. I just wanted to put my story out there. And I thought that would be the end of it. I thought I, I put it out there. People know who he is and then whatever happens is going to happen. I was not prepared for the haters and the trolls that came at me and you know, it's so hard because you already, you're beating yourself up enough. You don't need anyone else to beat you up. But, you know, people started calling me stupid and, you know, how did you believe this? And they attack you over stupid stuff, you know. And it's really unfortunate, the level of victim shaming that goes on, because that's not the point that, I, you know, that's not where the finger should be pointed. You're talking about somebody in his case, not only had he conned me and conned other women, you know, he literally killed people. I mean, he had put this plastic windpipe <clears throat> into eight patients. Seven of them are dead. The only one that's still alive had the thing taken out. It, it would come out that he had used people literally as human guinea pigs. He never did any of the experiments that you're supposed to do before you on animals before you experiment on humans. He skipped all the ethical approvals. He, he exaggerated the results of of the surgeries in press conferences, in medical papers that were published in prestigious journals, The Lancet, other places. He was lying. He was lying about the success. He's standing there telling the world that, you know, the, this revolutionary surgery is working when in fact it never worked and the patients were suffering. They suffocated to death basically because this plastic tube that he put in their throats 
never worked. It was rotting, you know, they died horrible deaths. I mean, it's just, it's just awful. It's beyond comprehension what he did. And, and that's where all the focus should be. So yeah, the victim shaming part and the, all of that is, is difficult. Unfortunately, that's for some reason, that's what people do. You know, they, they, uh -huh. they want to point the finger at the woman and, and that's another reason I've become so adamant about talking about this all the time, because it's just, it's sad. If that's what you take away from the story, you know, that you want to point the finger at me and you're more concerned about why I believe something and, or why anybody believes something, that's not the point. And the, the other thing about that is that's the reason people don't talk. You know, it's, it's already embarrassing. It's already humiliating. And then to open yourself up to more of that, it's not fun. Trust me, you know, there's nothing fun. Sometimes people say, oh, you just wanted the, the notoriety. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, I would much rather have never done this, you know? I didn't have to do this, you know? I could have stayed quiet, you know? I didn't even have to tell any of the crazy details about the story, but I did because I needed people to know how crazy of a liar he is. So, but there's nothing fun about it. There's nothing fun about being attacked. And this is the problem, you know, they count on us being quiet, you know, they count on us being too embarrassed to talk. But if we don't talk, then this continues, you know, they keep getting away with it. And that's, you know, it perpetuates. So, and not every woman can talk. There are a lot, a lot of times people can't talk for, you know, the kids involved, the variety of reasons, but if we can talk about it, I think it's very, very important to talk about it. And also to let women know that if you get conned, you're not stupid. I promise you, you're not stupid. You know, you, what did you do? Your crime? What was your crime? You fell in love. You wanted to trust the person that you fell in love with. That's not a crime. Mm -hmm. You know, they are the criminals. Society victim shames women. And if you listen to this episode and you're like, no, that's not true. It is true. It is true. I mean, so many people think, you know, with women, oh, you just want love. Well, men and women, we have a heart. We all think the same. We all act the same. And I mean, I'm pretty sure that if a man went through this, oh, they those type of comments are stupid. No. That would never have come up. No. You know? The other one I get all the time is, oh, you're just a gold digger. And, and which that one really irritates me because... I was very successful, you know, when I met him. I didn't I didn't need his money, didn't want his money, you know, and like why can't a woman be successful in her own right? Has it ever occurred to you that, you know, women have their own money and they're just fine. They don't need a man to come along and, you know, and not to mention the fact that I lost a ton of money on this fake wedding that he created because, you know, I I paid for the wedding invitations and the dresses and all this stuff and he let me spend money on a wedding that he knew was never going to happen. So the gold digger one is, it's, it's actually kind of funny. You know, that, that's the last thing that was going on here. I don't think that he probably ever expected that you would have gone this far and shared your story because I think he probably expected from the vulnerability of when he met you of, yeah. well, you'll be heartbroken and you'll stay quiet. And that is yeah. the complete opposite of what happened in yeah. this. I think he vastly underestimated me. I'm sure to this day he's shocked, you know shocked that I talked, shocked that I keep talking. Um, I think, and I think he targeted me for that reason. I think at the beginning he thought, um, you know, he would end up having so many problems in his professional life. When I met him, none of that had come out yet to the public, but he knew, you know, he had to know that it was going to implode. He knew that this surgery he was doing wasn't working. He knew that he was lying about it. You know, it was just a matter of time until it caught up to him. So I think when he met me, he thought, okay, here's a smart, success, successful journalist. Let me, you know, woo her. Let me get her to fall in love with me and let me kind of stick her in my back pocket. And then when, you know, everything hits the fan, she's going to be there to protect me. And I think he really thought that I would do that, that I would stand by him and I would defend him. And protect him and you know and for a moment right before I figured everything out I did um when the allegations first started coming coming out about that he had lied on some of his medical papers you know he said that he was being unfairly maligned and attacked and I for a minute but I don't think he in his wildest dreams never anticipated that I would come at him full for force 
and that I wouldn't stop. I'm sure I'm his biggest nightmare now, and that's just fine. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> do you think if the whistleblowers would not have come out, do you think he ever would have stopped? Um, you know, eventually it had to catch up with him. And he was, I mean, he was doing something that didn't work. You know, there was no way eventually it wasn't going to catch up. I think it would have taken longer. You know, um, mm -hmm. the whistleblowers were very brave. You know, they put their necks on the line. They were also attacked for, you know, speaking out against him. I mean, he was a superstar. He was a super surgeon. And Karolinska, the place that he worked at in Sweden, which is very prestigious, I think when people, when they first started going to Karolinska and saying, look, something's wrong, nobody wanted to hear it. It was a very, very inconvenient truth because there's so much money attached to this man and prestige and grants and you know accolades and he was rumored to be in contention for a Nobel Prize himself so I think a lot of people wanted to sweep it under the rug so if they had not been so persistent and tenacious it would have taken longer I think you know and if I had not come out with my story it was definitely a combination of the two because when you put mm -hmm you know, this avalanche of the personal lies together with this, these egregious, awful medical lies. It was just so obvious that this man is a pathological liar and lies about everything. Mm -hmm. You're speaking out for so many women and empowering women that have gone through similar situations. I don't think there's anything that's going to be linear with what has happened to you, but I, I think that. that you are allowing women to have a little bit of grace for themselves because I think we're so hard on ourselves. Yeah. And I think that when we dive into something, whether it be a romance or a career of the unknown, we want it to work because we have this fear as a woman of failure. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. I mean, that's one of the reasons I keep talking about this, you know, because truly, I mean, people, so often we'll say, oh, that would never happen to me. You know, I, I, I you know, I would never believe it. You know, and in and, and 2020 hindsight, it's very easy to go back and say, well, why didn't you see this? Why didn't you say that? But I promise you, it can happen to you. It can happen to anybody. And I'm putting myself out there and being so candid about everything because I want people to know, look, you know, it happened to me. I mean, I, in some ways, I'm the last person on the planet that should have gotten fooled, right? I'm an investigative journalist, but I got fooled. I got fooled because I fell in love, you know, and because I was vulnerable. And that literally can happen to anybody. And again, these are very cunning criminals. They're very manipulative. They know what they're doing. And so I do want women to be kinder to themselves, you know, you, and that's why the victim shaming is so appalling and sad, really, because that's not the point, you know? And I, mm -hmm. I made a promise to myself when this happened that I didn't want him to change me, right? I didn't want him to change the essence of who I am. I've always been a very loving person with my friends, my family, everybody. I'm a hopeless diehard, diehard romantic, and I didn't want him to make me bitter, you know, and to make me angry. And I didn't want to give him the power of doing that as well. And that's what I want for all women. It's, it's okay. You know, you know, you have a big heart, you're a caring person, you fell in love. That's not a crime. And, you know, we're not the problem. They are, they are the liars, mm -hmm. you know, they're the sociopaths or whatever they are. You know, I can't diagnose him, but I believe he is some kind of sociopath. And I agree. <laughs> yeah. And I do hope if women can take that from my story, if I can help women feel less stupid, less alone, less anything, then in some weird way, it makes it make sense. You know, it makes me feel like maybe this was supposed to happen to me. You know, maybe it had to be me. Um, maybe another woman would have stayed under the bed and not come out and would have crumbled. But because I had, as a journalist, once I kind of snapped out of it and put my journalist hat back on, I knew what to do. I knew how to expose him. And I have the determination and, you know, and the strength to do it and not stop. And in some bizarre way, it makes me feel like, okay, you know, as horrible as it, as it all has been and as much as it messed up my life, I, maybe it was supposed to happen to me. Brings me to the next huge focus. Um, he's not in jail. 
he has been found guilty, but he is still not in jail. Which is absolutely shocking and appalling to me. He was convicted in Sweden finally to 30 months behind bars, which is not even enough time, but he of aggravated assault in connection with the deaths of three of the patients that died. He appealed all the way to the Supreme Court in Sweden. The Supreme Court in October said, no, we're not taking the case. You know, um, your prison sentence stands. That was October. Here we are in January. The man is still not behind bars, has not been arrested. And he's trying to negotiate in classic narcissistic fashion. He's trying to negotiate to spend his prison time in Spain on house arrest. So he basically wants to sit by his pool in Spain with his kicking up his feet with a drink. And that's how he thinks he's going to serve his 30 months, you know, behind bars. And he's still doing interviews. He just did one yesterday you know, on, on, on Italian TV. He looks like a crazy man, a crazy professor, but uh -huh. now he's trying to launch a smear campaign. He's, you know, attacking me. He's attacking this other woman that came forward very bravely in the Netflix documentary which, by the way, was a fourth family. So it turns out there were four families that we know about that he had at the same time. And so now he's attacking us. And I, it's just nuts. I, I just can't, I can't fathom the fact that he's not behind bars. It's just disturbing, you know? And his it's not justice, you know? His patients and their families deserve justice and him walking around free is not justice. Mm-hmm. Which brings me to the question, what does life look like for you now? Everybody wants to know what what moving on and moving ahead looks like for you now. You know, I don't think you can go through something like this and not have trust issues. You know, it takes time. Um, again, I made that promise to myself that I would not allow him to change me. And I think I've managed to, to honor that promise to myself. Um, but it has taken time. It takes a long time to trust. It takes a long time to trust yourself. I think that's the hardest thing, actually. It's almost less about trusting other people than trusting yourself because mm -hmm. I thought I had good instincts. You know, I thought um, I'm a journalist. I thought I could, you know, spot this kind of thing. And so that takes time. Um, however, I am now and I have a a serious boyfriend. I'm in a very happy relationship and I am happy to say that I've finally found love again. And this in a weird way, as I was saying before, has turned into something very rewarding. You know, the fact that I've been able to turn this insane mess into something where I can actually help other people and I can help fight for justice for his patients that is very rewarding, you know, and even with all the stupid trolls and haters that come out, I mean, for every negative message, there are 200 positive ones. And I'm still always blown away by the people take the time to write me the most beautiful, encouraging messages. And I can't always respond to them, but I want people to know that I read every single one of them and everyone means a lot to me. And it's just that really is beautiful. And they're not all just from women. They're largely from women, but a lot of men write too. Well, I'm glad that you came on today and shared your story with us. And I'm so happy to hear that you have found love and that you, you seem happy and comfortable and content and successful out of everyone in the world. You truly deserve all of that Thank you. and so much more. Thank you. Really appreciate it.